Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Linear TV's Pains Are Connected TV's Gains, Cash In on the Ad Spend Shift. I'm your host, Ross Benish, Senior Analyst at Insider Intelligence, based in New York. I'm joined by my colleague, Principal Analyst Paul Verna, who's also based in New York. Hey, Paul, good to have you here. Hey, Ross, great to be here. Before we get into our main presentation, I'd like to thank Mountain for making today's webinar possible and welcome Tim Edmondson, Senior Director of Content and Research at Mountain. Tim is joining us from just outside Los Angeles. Hey, Tim. Hey, Ross. Pleasure to be here. Happy to have you. Now, a few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes. We'll email you a link to view the slides and the full recording of today's presentation but we do want you to participate. So just use the chat window on the right of the video feed to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A at the end of this session. So with that, let's get started, Paul. Well, hi everyone, and thanks for having me along today. As Ross mentioned, I'm gonna talk about CTV advertising and by extension, TV. Before I dive in, I just want to say up front that all the data I'm showing is based on our latest forecast from the first half of this year and for the U.S. only. I do talk about a couple of earlier forecasts for comparison, and I'm going to throw in a little bit of third-party data, but that will all be clearly spelled out. So here's our agenda for today. I'm going to start with our top-line estimates of CTV and linear TV ad spending talk about the programmatic component of CTV, look at the paths to purchase for CTV, share some data on where CTV ad budgets are coming from, go over our forecasts of cord cutters and pay TV viewers, look at time spent data and how it relates to ad spending, give a snapshot of top CTV platforms, including fast channels. Also talk a little bit about viewer demographics, uh, wrap up with some takeaways, and as always, leave room at the very end for audience Q&A. So on that first agenda item, here's our long view of CTV ad spending. And this starts in 2017 when we started tracking CTV and goes all the way to 2027. So it gives you a good timeline of where the market was headed before the pandemic, what COVID did to it, and what we can expect in the next several years. So a few things jump out. During this time, we're gonna see a more than 10X increase in spending. There's a big bump in 2020 and an even bigger one in 2021, because unlike traditional TV, which we'll look at later, CTV saw a big lift from people staying home and binging on streaming services during the lockdowns. And also a lot of big CTV platforms like Peacock and Disney Plus uh, launched right around the start of the pandemic. And even though Disney Plus wasn't ad supported at that time, there was a flurry of new ad inventory that happened to coincide with the pandemic. Now, if we look at the percentage change line, a few more things come to mind. So first, the market was enjoying really fast growth at the beginning of this forecast, which is pretty typical when you're starting from a small base and things are going well. Now, if it hadn't been for those anomalous years in 2020 and 21, we might have seen uh, growth trend downward in more of a smooth progression from 2019 to 2022. What's also interesting is that this year's growth will outpace last year's, and that's because 2022 was not a great year for the ad business in general, and CTV was affected by that. A little more on that later. Also interesting is that when we look ahead to the rest of the forecast, we're actually going to see year-to-year -year growth in the double digits all the way through, which is impressive for a market that's very mature at $25 billion and going up past $40 billion. And here's how our CTV forecast changed over the past three years. I'll start with our H1 2020 forecast, which we put out right before the onset of COVID. So at that time, we were expecting CTV ad spending to almost double from about eight plus billion in 2020 to, to about 16 billion in 24. Now, when we revised this forecast in 2021, we jacked it up quite a bit after the dust settled from the COVID shutdowns. We saw that streaming was getting a boost from people uh, being stuck at home. 
So we made an upward adjustment. In 2022, we again raised the forecast quite a bit. And then our latest update, we raised it ever so slightly for 2023 and 24, but lowered it for the latter part of the forecast. Hey, Paul, um, could you um, get into why in the 2023 forecast, the data is updated for previous years like 2020 and 2021? Yeah. We typically uh, update our forecast when we get new streams of data, and sometimes those data streams inform the forecast retroactively. So in this case, we just saw a lot of data that led us to uh, slightly revise those assumptions that we've made for past years. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would like to draw your attention to 2024, which is the last year shared by all these forecasts. So for that year, we are now expecting a CTV ad market that's almost 13 billion higher than our outlook back in early 2020. So this gives you an idea of how much the market has grown in absolute dollar terms, but also how it's blown past our expectations with almost every update. So this next chart shows the aggregate of our linear TV and CTV forecast. And I'll start with TV and the black bars. So. The first thing to point out here is just the massive drop in 2020, which was, of course, related to COVID. Before that point, we thought the TV ad spending would pretty much flatline, but we didn't think it would lose almost $9 billion in a year. There was a rebound in 2021 that carried into 2022, but from then on, we're, we're just going to see a net decline to around $56 billion in 2027. There are some slight bumps in even number years because of ad spending on elections and big sporting events. But aside from that, this is a market in clear decline. So on a compound annual basis, the TV growth rate is negative at 2.1% for the period shown, which is 2017 to, 20, to 2027. Now, when you layer in CTV, it's a totally different story. So these numbers in the red bars are going to grow in every year in this forecast. And for comparison, the CAGR for CTV is over 30%. Now, when you look at the combined TV CTV ad market, it's also a growth story, though a couple of times the gains in CTV aren't enough to offset the losses on the linear side. That happened in 2020, and we expect it to happen again this year. But overall, despite the decline in linear TV and the jolt of the pandemic, the total market will grow by 3% on a CAGR basis during this period, and it'll hit close to 100 billion by 2027. And when I say the total market in this context, I mean ads that show up on your home TV screen, whether you get your signal through a traditional cable, satellite, or telco service, or whether you watch internet delivered programming through, say, uh, on demand streaming service or VMVPD. So, now let me put CTV in the context of other big ad channels that we track. So although it's been growing faster than pretty much everything else this year, it's actually a smaller market than these other categories. And we expect that to continue to be the case through at least the end of our forecast in 2027, and realistically, probably for a few years after that. Um, a big part of that is because retail media it will grow faster than CTV starting next year and for several years after that. Retail media is already 20 billion bigger. That happened very quickly. And that gap is just gonna keep getting wider. Now we do think CTV will eventually catch up to TV, but not before 2027 and probably closer to the end of the decade. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, I wanna spend a minute on programmatic as it relates to CTV. So the dollar volume of CTV ad inventory transacted programmatically looks a lot like the top line CTV figures I shared at the beginning. And that's just simply because the percentage of CTV inv uh, inventory that's transacted this way is almost 90% and growing. So I'll come back to that in a second. Hey, Paul, but, um, about, about CTV's programmatic yeah. influence, um, how much of that is coming from YouTube? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an exact percentage, but it's somewhere around 40%. And obviously, YouTube is uh, predominantly or, or totally programmatic. I will also say that our definition of programmatic is pretty all-encompassing. So it's any ad sold with any amount of automation. So that could also include like programmatic direct or uh, programmatic guaranteed. But yeah, YouTube is definitely a, a big part of this. So that's definitely worth pointing out. Um, 
Now, there was a big spike in 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021, that's COVID related. And then the drop off in 2022 looks pretty steep coming off of those big increases. But if you were to plot a line, say from 2019 to 2022, it would show a more natural decline that's pretty typical as a market matures. And in any case, growth rates in the 20s and teens are impressive by any measure. And back to that 90% figure, uh, so this blue line shows just how much of total CTV inventory is transacted programmatically. And we see this rising from 80% to almost 90% during this period. Now, I often talk about how CTV is similar to TV, but in this regard, they're actually quite different and in a way that favors CTV when it comes to all the benefits and even some of the risks uh, that come with programmatic. So on the plus side, you have better targeting, better measurement, and better attribution capabilities compared with TV. But on the other hand, programmatic can elevate the risk of uh, fraud and threats to brand safety and inventory quality and things like frequency capping, which is the weird technical term for seeing the same ad over and over when you watch a show, which I'm sure you've all experienced as I have. So the industry is starting to solve for some of those issues, but a lot more progress needs to be done. So with that, I'd like to spend a minute on a couple of third-party studies that looked at the source of CTV ad budgets. So the first one in this chart is a study the IAB conducted with standard media index and advertiser perception. So it shows that the reallocation from linear TV and other types of digital video is where most of this budget shift is coming from. But social isn't far behind. Um, that, that gives you a little bit of an idea of how advertisers perceive social these days when a lot of platforms are having trouble monetizing at the levels they did a couple of years ago because of privacy issues and a whole bunch of other uh, factors. Now, in a separate study by Advertiser Perceptions and Premium, about half the marketers they surveyed said that their linear TV budgets would be affected by the increased allocation of CTV. So that's just another data point that supports our diverging forecasts of these two formats. Now to shift gears again, here's a snapshot of the very complex and fragmented ways that CTV ads are purchased. We break these down into three main categories. So on the left, we have devices and operating systems, and these can be from tech firms like Amazon or Roku, but also from smart TV makers that have ad platforms like Samsung, Vizio, and LG. Then in the middle, there are the programmatic middle players appropriately, the trade desk, Microsoft, Freewheel, et cetera. And then on the right, there are streaming services. Now, some of these are aligned with TV network groups like Hulu, Disney Plus, and Peacock. And in those cases, your CTV buy might even be combined with linear inventory. But then there are also the pure play digital services like Netflix. And Ross, since I stole, I mean borrowed, um, this slide from your very excellent CTV explainer report, can you just walk us through some of the pros and cons of each of these three options? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, the way I like to think about it is that there's uh, trade-offs between scale and precision with whatever method you're using to buy CTV inventory. Um, you know, if you really want to know where your ads are running and, and get down to the level of even being able to know exactly which shows your ads appeared in, you're, you're probably better off going straight to a streaming service like uh, Paramount or buying from Disney. Uh, but the downside of doing that is that if you want to scale your campaign, you have to make individual buys across a dozen different TV networks and streaming services. On the flip side, if you go to a programmatic intermediary like the Trade Desk or you go to a device manufacturer that sells ads as part of its operating system like Samsung, Fire TV, and Roku, you can quickly purchase inventory across dozens if not hundreds of apps but you're gonna get less information on where those ads ran. You're not gonna know what shows they ran against necessarily. So um, you know, each method of inventory purchasing has its pros and cons, but they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, advertisers will often use these in combination. You know, it's, it's not unusual at all for a single campaign to have ad buys across uh, Hulu and Roku and, and the trade desk, 
but you're, you're going to get a little bit different uh, inventory and a little bit different audience data with each type of ad buy that you do. Yeah, those are great points, Ross. And yeah, and I'll just add that this fragmentation also causes some pain points around CTV. And I'm thinking of things like a lack of standardization when it comes to measurement or issues like frequency capping, which I um, mentioned a little bit earlier. All right, so all that said, I'd like to move on to our forecast of pay TV viewers and cord cutters. So I'll start with pay TV viewers in the black line, and this is an unmistakable downward trend that's so glaringly obvious that it just really speaks for itself. Then we have non-pay TV viewers in the red line, and it's pretty much exactly the mirror opposite of pay TV. Now, before I go further here, let me just talk a little bit about the terminology here, which I admit is, is a little bit unwieldy. So when we say pay TV, we're really referring to traditional pay TV. So we mean people who are paying for a monthly channel, a TV channel package through cable satellite or telco providers. On the other hand, when we say non-pay TV viewers, we're referring to people who either cut that traditional pay TV cord or never had that subscription in the first place. So we call these folks cord cutters and cord nevers, and the red line is the combination of those two groups. So in essence, what's been happening for many years now is that that traditional cable slash satellite slash telco universe has been shrinking while the number of cord cutters and cord nevers has been rising. And the tipping point where those lines cross is actually this year. So after that, we're gonna see these lines just continue to move in opposite directions. Now, things get a little tricky when you factor in folks who are paying for live TV through services like YouTube TV, Hulu with live TV, Sling TV, or Fubo TV, and the ugly acronym for those services, which I think I, I said earlier is VMVPDs. And here is actually what that viewership looks like. So it's relatively small compared to the other two. And it's really a toss up whether you consider VMVPDs a subset of pay TV or a subset of non pay TV. So that just really comes down to how you define pay TV. But the main point is that a growing amount of live TV is delivered via the internet. And a lot of what's driving those subscriptions is live sports. Now, this chart doesn't show it, but we estimate that over 70% of the, v the VMVPD audience is live sports viewers. And that number has grown steadily during the life cycle of VMVPDs. All right, so let's move on to time spent data. I'll start with a long view of time spent on TV. This peaked in 2012 at uh, four hours and 37 minutes, but it's gonna drop all the way down to two hours 40 by 2025. Now, looking at CTV, the trend line, of course, heads in the opposite direction. We've only been tracking this since 2019, but the data is crystal clear. We're not quite at a crossover point yet, but all signs are that it'll happen later this decade. And the delta between these two lines was well over three hours back in 2017. And by 2025, it'll be less than 30 minutes. So with that, I'd like to shift to an analysis of the relationship between time spent and ad spending on both traditional and CTV. We'll start with CTV on the left. I know this, this is a, a lot of um, information packed into this slide. So let's just zero in on the years um, 2012, 2019, and 2025. And the reason I'm singling those out is that those years basically mark the beginning or end of directional trends. And they happen to roughly correlate to the beginning of the streaming era, which really disrupted um, traditional TV. Then we had the last year before the pandemic and then the final year of our forecast. So looking at the period from 2012 to 2019, time spent in the red line headed downward while ad spending increased. And that's a sign of a market in disarray because logically ad spending should track with time spent. Since 2019, the market has normalized to where the trend lines are moving in parallel. Now, normalized is a relative word uh, considering that linear TV, ad spending, and time spent are both going in the wrong direction, but at least there's a direct relation between them. And that tells us that marketers are investing according to where the opportunities are or aren't. Whereas before that, you could say that there was a disconnect 
that could have been based on inertia or on the fact that CTV wasn't quite ready for prime time or on other factors. Now, shifting to the CTV chart on the right, there's a much more logical relationship in the relatively short time we've been tracking these metrics. So both these lines trend positive every year in this forecast, but what's interesting is how ad spending is now rising faster than time spent. And that's not a problem by any stretch. In fact, it's an indication that the value prop of CTV is becoming more apparent to advertisers. I don't think we're gonna see these lines break apart much more than they have, but they should continue to move in parallel. All right, so I'd like to pivot now to CTV ad platforms. So Hulu and YouTube, in that order, uh, will see the highest CTV ad revenues in the US this year. Hulu is closing in on 4 billion and YouTube on 3 billion. Now there's a lot going on with these platforms with Hulu in a sort of limbo while Disney's trying to figure out whether or not it's gonna buy the rest of it by the end of this year. And YouTube has had some rocky quarters and a change of leadership. But one thing that, that tends to get lost in the mix with YouTube is that it's had about a 50% increase in time spent on CTV over the past few years. So that's a lot of what's driving this. Uh, Roku is the next biggest platform with CTV ad revenue north of 2 billion. And that's pretty remarkable when you think that up until a few years ago, Roku was mainly a device company, but now it makes most of its revenue uh, from ads on the Roku channel. The next three are all marching toward a billion a year. So those are Pluto, Peacock, and Tubi. This is an indication of how well the so-called fast channels are doing, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, then the two newcomers to the ad space, uh, Disney Plus and Netflix. So based on this ranking, they don't look like huge players, but they will definitely scale really fast and climb up this leaderboard in the next couple of years. The last platform on this list is Paramount Plus, which will also scale up. Now you might notice some big names missing from the list and some are in the other sub OTT bracket. They include uh, Max, Discovery Plus, ESPN Plus, Apple TV Plus, and Prime Video. We don't break those out yet, but they're big players that are also likely to grow. And lastly, there's a whole slew of CTV ad sellers that fall into this big other category like the MVPDs and TV makers with ad platforms and a smattering of social video and retail media uh, and even the ad tech intermediaries like the Trade Desk, uh, which speaks to the programmatic CTV slide that we talked about a little bit earlier. All right, so let's go on to free premium video streaming channels, which um, basically overlap with what are more commonly known as fast channels. So the headline here is that this market will have more than 100 million viewers in the US this year. And when you look at the growth trend line, you see a big uptake through 2021 and more modest increases from that point on, settling in at low single digits by 2027. So this is a market that sprinted out of the gate and scaled quickly, but it's now getting close to a saturation point. And drilling down on some of the biggest players in this space, I showed earlier how Roku, Roku is the third highest earning CTV platform, and this reinforces that. Uh, close behind Roku are Tubi and Pluto TV, which also showed up in that breakdown. And a bit lower down, we have Amazon Freebie and Crackle with Amazon uh, scaling much faster. Now, when these channels emerged around 2018, their audiences were around 10, 15 million, depending on the service. This year, they'll range from about 35 to almost 70 million. Excuse me. And by 2027, the Roku channel will be at around 80 million and Crackle at around 40. Okay, so for the last area I'll cover, let's just go over some demographic data starting with CTV. So the two groups that make up the largest audience share are millennials, followed pretty closely by Gen Z and more distantly by boomers. So these breakdowns don't match up exactly with those generational divides, but they're they're pretty close. Now, on the traditional TV side, it's a very different story. So I have to admit, I hadn't caught up with this data in a while. I knew the TV viewing population was aging. 
And I figured uh, Gen X or younger boomers have the biggest share, but it's actually the 65 plus group that predominates and by a long shot. And I really can't think of a more compelling data point to drive home the need to adopt CTV if you're trying to reach millennials, um, but also to consider the combination of TV and CTV if your target audience spans a wider age range. And of course, as Ross mentioned, and as we'll get on uh, get into later, there are a lot of complexities and overlap. So I, I'm not trying to oversimplify, but I, I do think those demographic uh, highlights are pretty striking. So that brings us to our takeaways. And um, first up is that there's no time like the present to sink your teeth into CTV. Most platforms now have the scale that marketers have been holding out for, and there's more and more programming going exclusively to CTV services, including live sports. All the CTV metrics that we track are heading up and to the right, and they're filling the gaps left by traditional TV where ad spending is declining and audiences are aging. More CTV platforms now offer ad supported tiers. Of course, Netflix and Disney Plus joined the ranks in the past year and Amazon and Apple aren't likely far behind. Sports are the tip of the spear. Most leagues have licensed content to streaming services, sometimes exclusively. Uh, and those services could include tech companies like Amazon and Apple and YouTube, but also standalone SVOD services and VMVPDs. <clears throat> so if you are holding out for sports, the transition from the legacy ecosystem to CTV, it's already happened. And lastly, there are still problems to solve. So there's a lot more work to be done in areas like measurement, shoppable ads, attribution, and frequency capping, all of which could be webinars on their own. But for now, I will leave it at that and turn it back over to you, Russ. Well, that was great, Paul. Thank you. And before we get to your live questions, we've had some good ones, so keep them coming. I'd like to bring back our special guest, Tim Edmondson, Senior Director of Content and Research at Mountain. Welcome again, Tim. Thank you. Good to be here. So many advertisers have been shifting their budgets from linear television to streaming. Is this where you suggest that clients should invest? Um, yeah, I think that connected to, I mean, if you saw the stats, you saw the the trends in this presentation, um, connected TV is definitely a lucrative place to be, uh, your peers and your competitors are investing there as well. Um, and to the question of linear TV ad spend, is that shifting over to CTV? You, you know, you saw that stat. Yes, it is. Um, an interesting thing from where we sit, uh, on, from mountain, uh, a lot of the customers that we work with, uh, 66%, two out of every three, uh, they're first time TV advertisers connected TV has given them an opportunity to get on the TV screen. The main reason being it's a, it's a digital ad channel. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but it has better, uh, audience targeting measurement attribution. Um, it could function very similar to, uh, other digital paid channels that are out there right now. Um, and we've seen um, from our customer base, and this was something that was um, reflected in the data earlier, is that social media is a big uh, source of budget. Um, reason being that you know a lot of brands have video strategies on social media. Um, seeing CTV, CTV as an extension of that, as a, another digital video channel that is uh, capable of delivering on direct outcomes and being able to measure them, uh, it's been a natural transition for budget uh, to come from social into connected TV. And so that's what we're we're seeing on our side of things. And how do you think AI is going to affect CTV advertising over the next year? That's a good question. I think AI is everywhere right now. Um, in fact, it's actually, before going into the future case, it's it's present connected TV right now. And you'll see it into the, into the future as well. Uh, primary use case for it is the um, automated media buying. So that programmatic piece uh, that you had touched on earlier, uh, a lot of that uh, can be carried out and is carried out by uh, AI driven machine learning, you know, algorithms that are uh, purchasing media programmatically on uh, different streaming services and tying it back to a goal that an advertiser is seeking out, like a return on ad spend, a cost per acquisition, something like that. Um, that's how it functions on our platform. Um, and so, yeah, AI already has a presence on connected TV. And another thing that I think is going to be a big piece of um, the discussion moving forward is the, the, the need for more TV ads, 
Um, mentioned a lot of folks are, are new to the space. And so there's a need for creative, uh, uh, creating TV commercials and generative AI um, has been proving itself to be capable of at the very least uh, fast tracking creative processes, um, be it script building, um, imagery, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of success. We've actually been toying with this on our side of things, um, using it to storyboard out uh, different stories and different ads. And so this is something that we, we just recently announced um, something called Mountain Viva. It's a, it's a video editor that uses generative AI. And the whole point is to give marketers another tool to be able to create more ads um, faster. Um, because our data shows that if an advertiser is using multiple ad variations, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be a net new ad, but it's something that has perhaps a different title card or it's edited slightly differently. Uh, they outperform those who are just running one uh, one TV ad. Um, and that has something to do with, you know, uh, allaying some of the, the problems with ad fatigue or, um, you know, being able to target specific audiences and demographics with messaging that's tailored to them. It gives that flexibility for it. So yeah, I think AI will will have a, a stronger presence uh, in the year to come. Makes sense. Um, you know, Paul had a slide in the middle of his presentation showing how time spent shifted towards streaming faster than the ad dollars followed. What kind of shifts have you seen within the last year? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we've seen, you know, I mentioned before, a lot of the advertisers that are, are coming to our platform are first time TV advertisers. So I think that's a trend that will continue to play out um, because connected TV is really expanding the use case for a lot of advertisers that if they have a, a performance oriented strategy, they need to see dollars coming that, uh, back in for every dollar coming out. That makes television a viable ad channel. Before, there's more of an aw awareness play, top level, kind of reserved for specific types of advertisers. That's no longer the case. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of that. Um, I think a stat that I've seen in the past also is that you know, American TV households, 49% uh, of them are watching CTV on a daily basis. Uh, that's compared to 39% in 2021. So, you know, just like the theme of this presentation, there's a lot of growth there. Um, these advertisers are trying to play catch up. And it's a little surprising that we haven't seen the ad spend really start to flow in and keep pace with consumers. But, you know, every graph that we looked at today is up and to the right. And so I think that's a temporary um circumstance. Okay. It, do you believe that advertising on CTV can affect the performance of other marketing channels? Definitely. Yes. Um, so TV is, it's a prestigious ad channel. Um, there's a reason that, you know, after uh, at the end of the year, there's like top 10 lists of, of TV commercials that come out or things tied to like major sporting events like Super Bowl. People rank the TV ads. You don't see that for banner ads. You know that's just not the case. Um, and so there is this certain um, attention on TV advertising, and it has a tendency to lift other efforts in in uh, ad mixes. We've seen that firsthand. We have um, we've actually done some analysis on this with some of our customers. Um, you know, paid social, paid search. Those have functions, those are lower funnel. They can be upper funnel, but especially paid search, lower funnel, looking for conversions. Um, if you have a TV ad that is engaging uh, consumers, if they are going onto a certain engine, you are now higher in their consideration set. You, you have been noticed by them. And so uh, it is likely that when they go to search for something, a service or a product, um, you're in mind. And that's not just not just saying that, we have data that, that proves that out. Um, we analyzed uh, based on Google Analytics, uh, advertisers with Mountain, the average uh, conversion rates uh, increase uh, for paid social uh, eight and a half percent after 90 days after starting a CTV campaign. For paid search, it's 22 percent. So there's definitely dividends to be paid on other ad channels. Uh, CTV is something that works great as an anchor point for other digital strategies. So highly recommend um, getting involved with it. Uh, but how can advertisers, you know, if they're running a CTV campaign, be sure that it's their CTV ads that are driving the results and not something else they're doing? That's a really good question. I think that's a question that's top of mind for a lot of folks uh, in the industry. Um, and it comes down to attribution. So uh, connected TV, generally speaking, um, 
it's a cross device experience. Someone sees an ad on a smart TV and then they visit an advertiser's website on a mobile device, a laptop, a tablet, what have you. There's just not that one-to-one um, uh, relationships. You know, no one's really clicking on TV ad. It's very much an edge case. And so the way that that's um, properly accounted for is just it's cross device attribution. Um, it's a model that uh, basically allows an advertiser to know when a, a TV ad has been seen by a consumer and then the actions they take afterward um, once they visit their website and eventually convert. Uh, that's done by developing a device graph. It's done by creating this basically a, a, a household map so that based on IP address um, and other tags, you have a good sense of every device in that household. Um, and so when you have someone who sees the TV ad, visits the website, you can uh, trace that journey because you're confident that household, that that action is taking place within a household that saw your ad. Um, where it gets a little complicated is, you know, that leaves the door open for other media. You know, you have other ad campaigns running. If you're targeting someone, generally speaking, they're going to be seeing ads on social, paid search, et cetera. And so one of the key elements in a, in a very responsible uh, attribution model is to have that deduplication. It's to have some sort of verification that will filter out any other uh, media sources if someone's visiting their website. So if someone goes on Google, clicks your paid search ad, even after they saw the TV ad, you have to give credit to that, that search ad. Um, and so a responsible attribution model would filter something out like that. Um, that's what we do um, at Mountain. We have something called uh, verified visits. It's got verified in the name. So obviously we take it serious. Uh, and yeah, I think that is, you know, if you're if you're worried about that, if you're working with an advertiser or an ad solution, like drill them, grill them on their um on their attribution model and see if you can get the answers. All right. Thanks, Tim. So now hey. we're gonna get into our audience QA. Uh, so we've received a lot of questions. The uh, the first one. Um, how is the writer strike impacting CTV and television ad spending? Yeah, that's a good question, Ross. When we um, published this forecast, it was right before the writer strike happened. We had an inkling that it might happen, but we didn't want to assume that it would. So we forecast uh, basically assuming normal conditions. Now, I will say that even if we had known that it would happen, it's not likely that we would have made a big shift in our forecast simply because it takes a very long time for ad spending to be affected by, by something like a strike. Because even if production of scripted programming stops or is, is reduced, you still have the ads basically going into other areas like live sports <clears throat> or uh, non-scripted programming. And a lot of what was happening at the upfronts was just some bartering or some jockeying for flexibility to be able to move those budgets accordingly. So as of right now, we don't think there's going to be a huge impact. But as with any strike, it really depends on the duration. Um, I think the writer strike is, is, has gone on for a while, and it may very well cross that 100-day threshold uh, from, you know, over the, the last one in, in 2007, 2008. So if it goes on for a lot longer, and certainly if it carries through the um, you know the fall season, then I think we probably will start to tweak the forecast. Which you know we do publish those forecasts twice a year. I was showing the H one forecast for like apples to apples because that's the last one we published, but we do update them in the fall. So we'll take a look again, uh, but I don't think it's going to be a huge correction either way. Well, yeah, and especially with streaming services that have international footprints. Um, right. Yeah, know, that's Netflix a whole other can factor. shift more of its focus to shows that aren't encumbered by the strike, but that's a yeah. that's a whole other thing. Um, another question we have is: um, while uh, CTV is a strong force nationally, do you believe that it's ready on the local level? I mean, I, I think that the more advertisers get comfortable with CTV, and the more they start to figure out the best use cases and where to use it, where not to use it, the more local is going to be part of it. Um, I mean, obviously you can target in, in more refined ways. So if, you know, if you're interested in targeting on a geographic basis, 
and CTV does allow you to do that. I mean, there's there's still the the issue of you know platforms that sell national inventory the, those two minutes an hour, but overall, I think local can and will be part of the story uh, of CTV as it has been for C for TV. So this question says that you mentioned many new fast channels are appearing. Do you have any data on how many and in which genres? And it also says. How long do you estimate the window to be open for adding new channels? Well, as far as the, we don't, I mean, we we break out the ones that I showed, those five, and we don't segment them by, by genre. And a lot of those channels have a lot of genres. So it, it would be hard to connect a, a fast channel to a genre until you get into the more niche channels. And, and then, you know, then I think you can. But I think for the purposes of some of the ones that are driving a lot of the growth, um, they're they're quite a mixed bag. And then as far as a window for new ones, we've definitely seen a gold rush. And when that happens, you know, you tend to see a lot of players come into the space that probably won't make the cut as it starts to winnow out. So I, I expect that to happen. I think there it's still a good time for certainly for the incumbents to build their businesses. And as far as new ones launching, I think if they service uh, a very specific audience and they are not, you know, overspending on on marketing or user acquisition, there's there's still probably some runway for them. This next question is for Tim. Uh, if I don't have multiple video assets, should I wait until I have more creative, or should I start using CTV with what I already have? I think honestly, the opportunity uh, to get involved uh, kind of trumps the um, lack of creative. I think that the just the notion of getting started, learning the ropes, seeing what you are capable of doing, uh, is worth it. And you know, granted, our stats show that you know more creative variations uh, results in better performance. That's not to say that the performance of having one ad is negligible. It's it's still strong, and um, you might have more options when it comes to uh, you might, basically you might have more uh, ads than you think. And uh, by we've seen some customers, some advertisers on our platform uh, take existing assets and re-edit them, um, changing the order or straight, frankly, just changing out an end card. Uh, the action that you want a viewer to take after seeing that ad, um, if it's a lower funnel campaign, you know, presenting some urgency in the call to action. Um, with like a shop now, if it's more of an awareness play where you're just reaching this new audience for the first time, a CTA of like shop online, just letting them know that you have that capability. Um, you can get creative with the assets that you currently have. So yeah, I mean, don't hesitate to, to start to experiment with the ad channel. Um, there's a lot of benefits and it's just not worth uh, missing out on it, waiting for, for better creative capabilities. So this next question could be answered by uh, either of you. Uh, it says that tracking is always an issue with CTV. Should we trust attribution? Uh, I can jump in to start. Um, yeah, I think that is a huge point of, uh, you know, it's causing a lot of nerves in the industry. Um, I think anyone, any ad partner that you're working with uh, should be transparent about how it functions, should be able to explain it simply um, and show the work essentially. Um, I think that a lot of the uncertainty comes from a lack of certainty from those who are providing attribution solutions. So I think I, I had mentioned this earlier, like if you're working with somebody, ask tough questions, um, put yourself at ease, ask the questions that, that you need answers for so you can be confident. And if they don't have solid answers for it, then, you know, take that into account and, and maybe find someone who does. Uh, so this question is, um, how do virtual cable services, um, assuming they mean uh, VMVPDs, uh, affect cord cutting? Well, I mean, there's a fairly direct correlation in the sense that if you are subscribed to a VMVPD, you're almost by necessity, um, you know, not subscribed to. I mean, you could be subscribed to both, but most people are not going to pay the seventy-five to a hundred dollars a month or whatever you know that final price point is for each of those services. So it is one or the other. So 
as we see the adoption of the MVPDs increase, we see the adoption of uh, traditional pay TV decrease. So, you know, it is kind of a, a one to one. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more to cord cutting than the MVPDs and actually on demand programming is probably what's driving more cord cutting. And I think now, you know, cord nevers are, are a bigger group because there's just a whole generation of people who really didn't grow up in that traditional cable TV ecosystem. So it's complex, but overall, I would say, you know, the more the MVPD adoption we see, the more it's going to um, drive cord cutting. So this question says, uh, I, I do a direct buy uh, with uh, Hulu. Is programmatic a better or more efficient way to purchase CTV? Well, I mean, not to split hairs here, but, you know, back to what I said earlier, that we have a very all-encompassing definition of programmatic. So you may be doing a direct deal with Hulu, and it may be, at least from our, our definition, programmatic. But overall, I think there's a complexity of factors and we alluded them to them earlier as to what should determine you know where you buy how you buy um and tim was just talking about the creatives which is another aspect of uh you know that goes into that that decision i don't think i can advise someone as to whether you know programmatic is right for them um or not i think i would have to know more about what the actual buy is, what the objectives are, uh, what the target audience is, and whether it's just simply on Hulu or whether you're trying to extend that to a broader array of streaming services. So, you know, no, no simple answers. I think you want to just kind of like look at all the options and, you know, we presented a lot of them and just, um, you know, just don't be afraid to, to test test different ones and see what works for you. And then this is our last question. Um, can you go a little deeper about how sports is driving CTV viewing? Yeah, well, you know, there's been kind of a sea change. And for a long time, the conventional wisdom was that sports was the glue that was holding that traditional cable TV system in place. And to an extent, that's still somewhat true. But just in the last couple of years, we've seen a whole slew of licensing activity uh, going either simultaneously to streaming or exclusively to streaming. We're also seeing that some of the TV network groups that have both linear and streaming channels, more of their viewing is happening on streaming services, including at big events like the Olympics and the World Cup. So I think, you know, sports is now becoming kind of democratized across that whole spectrum. So you have companies like Amazon and Apple and, and um, YouTube uh, that are licensing sports content. And in many cases, that's the only place you can watch it. Then you have um, a lot of the aggregators that are also getting into you know sports, but then you also still have a fair amount of it on linear and each case is different. I mean, I have a lot of conversations with fellow sports fans who kind of scratch their heads as to, you know, how do you watch your favorite team when, you know, the the viewing is now so fragmented across like, you know, maybe Apple, Apple TV and, um, you know, the a regional sports network and a VMVPD might have that regional sports network, might not. So it's a very, very complex ecosystem right now. But overall, more of it is going to CTV. And I think today, someone who is a cord cutter or a cord never can realistically watch almost all of the sports they want to watch. Whereas I think two, three years ago, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said that you still need an anchor um, to that cable system. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So thanks again to Paul for joining us. Thank you. And, and a special thanks to Tim and our team at Mountain. The eMarketer production team also deserves a huge thanks for making this webinar possible. So as promised, we'll be emailing you a link today with the slides along with the full recording of the session. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. And before we wrap up, let me take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. You can register for upcoming live analyst and tech talk webinars at eMarketer.com backslash webinars.
On the audio side, don't forget our Behind the Numbers podcast, which you can find anywhere where you can find podcasts. And finally, please check out our newsletters. We have a couple of options across retail, finance, and digital advertising, so there's something for everyone. And if you haven't already signed up, you can always do so at emarketer.com backslash newsletters. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your workday.